Re-Zero, Season 1, Director's Cut Episode 8. Very, very interested to see where Subaru goes from here. And Subaru is angry. Everything went very well last time. We were true anime harem protagonists, and all the girls... Love you, this is the worst part. This is the most brutal part of it. You owe me for the nice things I've done, and therefore I've done nothing nice ever, because I said that. It was all just calculus. <laughs> You know what's real pain? Real pain is that relationships do end this way all of the time, and you just live with it. Okay, the comments let me know, clued me in to some of the elements that I think were made more explicitly clear in the original text, which is that Julius actually doing Zamaru a solid, saving him from death, not just trying to like beat his head in for fun. So apologies for mischaracterizing Julius. Okay, well here it is. Julius just shooting up the rankings in the first 30 seconds of this episode. Meow. Oh, new. Wait, is this a new intro? Wow. Sparrow truly underwater right now. You know what's another dark thing? I know there's like, uh, maybe this is covered. There are what if timelines from the author. Okay, I know the pain of love heartbreak, especially love heartbreak that's mixed with shame. There is like a very real possibility that if somehow this were a true system, Subaru intentionally returns by death. Cause like if there was ever something to reset, this might sound crazy and I don't know. This is my limited experience, but the death stuff is physically painful. The time he jumped off that cliff that was perfectly made for jumping off of. Yeah, that probably hurt a lot. I mean, maybe it didn't, I don't know. It was definitely a difficult physical decision. The acid of like sitting around stewing on rejection by not only someone that you really like, somebody you really like whom you've made a center point of your salvation and entire identity, which is the whole source of the problem for Subaru. Not to make light of physical pain, not to try to like make pain comparisons about what's the most painful thing or whatever. It's just painful. It's not fun. It eats you. I'd want to redo it. And they cross and keep crossing until they are no longer in the same place. Also, I was focusing a lot on, on uh, Subaru and his role in that whole encounter, but it was also really interesting coming from Amelia and what she wants, who she is. Yeah, I want to know more about all of you now. Okay, at least Rem still is infatuated with us. Speaking of like sad, cynical realism, another path is that Subaru just dives into the relationship with Ren, Rem, all the while being somewhat unsatisfied with her and longing for Amelia. <laughs> Okay, you're very nice. I didn't knock you out and drag you out of that room before you could do any damage. I think it had more meaning than was immediately obvious. I got my ass kicked and embarrassed myself. How much does Subaru know about this? He is a really nice guy. Some responsibility from Subaru would be great here. Though it would be empathetic and understandable from his perspective to hate Julius. A man cannot serve two masters, they say. There's an element of it, people being nice to him now is going to be humiliating. At least he's putting his energy into something productive. Oh, he's learning how to fight. That would be the silver lining. You can't control Amelia. I don't think you make goals around Amelia. Or at least you don't make goals around her affection for you. I mean, the point in the first place was that you didn't respect her agency. So you respect her agency and it's on her. You then like refocus the lens on to what you can do. And a really nice one for Sabaro was like, I don't know if knighthood's on the table, but like whatever the actionable thing is that is parallel with knighthood, that kind of honor, the discipline, the skill, the place in society. That is like a really nice place to put that pain that isn't just hating everything and self-destructing and finding really jagged cliffs to jump off of. And I think that's a really cool template. Of course, it's not always easy to identify. I mean, one of the difficulties of life versus shows, the shows have like sort of a very clear narrative arc. Like it's so clear that like knighthood would be great for Subaru. What is the equivalent in real life? Tougher because there's just way more options, but there probably will be something to focus on that is directly connected to whatever the big pain point is. And the more centered to oneself and the more actionable it is, maybe the more specific it is, the better it is. I think that is one way to think about it. One of the best moments of my life came from being really dissatisfied with my occupation. I was teaching English in Korea and I was really 
really enjoying that for the being in Korea because that itself was really great for me. But the teaching part of it in like the academy system was just soul crushing. And that acceptance of the hatred and the vow to do something about it led to a bunch of really cool stuff of which I'm now enjoying the, the benefits of. And there's a meta gift in there too, which is increasing belief and faith in your ability to affect the course of your life and practicing not giving into just absolute despair and falling into a life of complaining and bitching, etc. Or blaming others. <laughs> But like, I don't know how much he's actually learning. Seems like he's just getting his ass kicked part two. <laughs> I'm glad, that's a relief that she said that. But I still like you even though you're pathetic. I can see your positive qualities. Interesting. If you really care about someone and you can see their positive qualities, you stick with them in moments of weakness and terribleness and embarrassment. <laughs> Nice of him to hang out with someone so poor and moneyless. Uh, in another timeline, she saved your daughter or located your daughter. Or does she? But also, right, don't lump her in together with the witch because she's a half elf. That's a powerful tool in someone's hands. Only idiots. Everyone knows that half elves are witches. Obviously, idiot. That's looking out for him, though, I guess. Yeah, get out of here, loser. That's also very Amelia, right? I mean, she. She's very afraid of burdening people. She goes out of her way to convince people that they don't have any debt to her. She doesn't seem like the type of person to be super forthcoming about the things that are bothering her. Especially as someone who is so focused on service to other people. And, you know, to being a leader and being strong and all that. Well, if this is an RPG, at least he's building up his defense stat, HP. Or he's giving himself head trauma from which he'll never recover. <laughs> It's bar I've been through. <laughs> what kind of healing is that and why is it the best healing? Is that what we were looking at? Sabara gets up to a bunch of crazy things behind the scenes. First Roswell's bath time. <laughs> Suck it up. It's very possible. You have no claim to Amelia. Face reality. Does that mean Crush Sama is telling him to train Subaru? This is assistance. Yeah, they're nothing but wolves. Ferris? <laughs> I mean, felt, felt. Who's Ferris? You know what just happened in my mind? I got crossed up because I was thinking this cat character, Felix, is very similar to like the beautiful boy character in Science Gate where my mind can't really fully process it. This is my first like really cute cat boy. Wait, it's so confusing. There's so many things crossing here. Ferris in Science Gate is the Nyao one. And this is Felix? I'm like at critical anime capacity right now. That's cool. There's a bombshell hidden in that sentence. She used that term eyes clouded when that's literally his power. God, the irony of having his main power be blinding himself or blinding others. Die? Imagine in the alternate timeline he does return by death and he goes back to like the second day in Russell's mansion. Honestly, he might be relieved. It probably is becoming a knight. Yeah, the defense. At least he has something to do, something to focus on, and something to believe in. Yeah. Keep your eyes looking forward. Yeah, what you talking about, Willem? Is it that you like me? Because I think we already know. Literally, they know this, right? She became more of a target. 
I don't know. I don't love it. I don't love it. I think this is maybe something his emotional angst has been waiting for his salvation. I think maybe he just dives back into the same problem. Yes. And I showed you more than that. She basically told you to F off. That wasn't for Subaru, it was for her. This is, is this not the, exactly the same thing as last episode? Only I can do this, even though I understand nothing about the situation, and therefore I might make it worse. Yeah, I thought we, okay. Okay. That was nice of her. That's not the reading I'm getting from it. She seems solid overall, and she also hasn't mentioned what she gets out of the contract with Amelia. I don't know what she stands to gain. And then she gave him that killer advice, and may even have been hitting on him. It's no coincidence that he's not seeing it. He's reeling from what happened, and he's trying to make it right under the previous framework for thinking. No, I, I was right. Wow, he's doubling down. Wild. I kind of love it. I guess we're going to the fog tent. <laughs> The white world just hasn't met the likes of me yet. Does that mean she deliberately sent that? Oh, okay. She wouldn't want to bother him. She just couldn't help herself. Stands for reason, given what we know. I really appreciate this. I mean, it's a very hum human look. I don't like the behavior, but I, I, I sympathize with it to an extent. Like I was talking about last episode, the mind definitely does play tricks with you when you're this infatuated. When you are so into someone and you've made them the point of your salvation and an inextricable piece of your identity, you have now subconsciously done something like link them to your, your survival, and, and it's not unlike a chemical addiction. And what that means, and this is definitely true of chemical addictions, there are so many different channels to your brain. I mean, there's the conscious layer. There may be like multiple conscious layers, I don't know, but there are also subconscious undercurrents that are scarily bigger actors than is initially obvious before you really start to figure this out by virtue of the fact that they're subconscious. Your emotional subconscious is orienting you towards a goal and that feels like life or death. And that has a way of like co-opting your conscious logical structures so that you will come up with reasons for which you must enter into situations where you've already kind of figured out will probably lead to the thing you're craving, even if it's terrible for you. An example is like you quit smoking. You can't come to terms with the conscious decision to smoke again. Though actually the first level, the most basic level to overcome is you will just suddenly come up with reasons why it's okay to smoke again. But one level past that is you've conquered that conscious level of thought. You'll suddenly find yourself, for example, saying, you know what, I'm not smoking, but I've been really good so I can just go out and like, have a drink with my friends. There's no smoking involved in drinking and then you're drunk and then drunk in you is uninhibited and so you're buying cigarettes suddenly. If you really think about it, you knew that would happen on some level beforehand. You were driving yourself into situations that would enable the behavior that you couldn't consciously decide on. With things like texting exes, right? You'll decide, I'm not going to text her. And then like, you're thinking about, oh, I wonder what was that conversation we had that one time? I remember she said something really good about me, didn't she? Let me like go through our text history and read all the texts. And then you read all the texts and you're emotionally compromised and then you contact her. Or you're having a fight with someone and like your conscious mind decides, you know what? I'm going to rise above this. I'm not going to fight them about this thing. Just end this fight here and like be the better man, whatever. And then the person comes home and puts their backpack down a little bit too hard and it makes a loud noise and startles you. And then you're you're attacking that person about the things you were previously mad about because you've been given this angle. These are just random and, and somewhat made up examples of like an endless list of possibilities that are hard to pinpoint or hard to be aware of. As far as identity, his whole life, his self-image, his self-worth, all the castles in the sky he's built around Amelia have been shattered and like left him with a void of nothing and he, he just needs that he's addicted to it there's a higher road where you figure yourself out and you focus on other things because it's hard to like eliminate something it's much easier to replace it there's also the one where you just like capitulate and go in circles for a while until you figure it out so Barra's not saving nothing there is a, a world in which this could go well and Spar actually is really helpful but Emilia will feel what's what you know like it has to happen purely he has to get over it ironically in order to have a chance at doing this well <laughs> Ground dragons failing us again, destroying our romances. It's gonna... Of course not. <laughs> Obviously. Why don't you forget about Amelia? <laughs> Subaru, Subaru, Subaru. Oh, wow. I 
I think maybe like a common reaction and it probably could just be in jest, which is fine. We'll be like, forget Amelia, right? Like, here you go. Why are you so focused on Amelia? You're here. Here you are with this girl who I assume is cute in your bed. But actually the serious Debbie Downer take is that that would be really unfair to Ram. Uh, uh, my reading of that will differ depending on what she actually means, where the faith is directed. Sweet though. Oh, is this the healing stuff? So what was the, like, his face and her boobs thing for? <laughs> that was just for Rem? That was just the cherry on the cake. Yeah, there's also a path there, but it has to be really honest. And he has to actually work out the issues, and he has to take responsibility. This is not that, though. Interesting that he linked that in a sentence, as if like one would flow from the other or be true from the other. Is this sort of like deliberately doing ASMR? ASMR? I guess there's something similar going on because, you know, how much Amelia means to Subaru because of the fact that she helped him when he was lost. Subaru did the same thing for Rem. People really like whispering into ears, though. God, the, the pain of the show, thinking about the fact that this is the longest stretch that we've gone without return by death, and it's also the worst period in our entire lives. Oh, she's gone. Oh, she's gone. She, she left him. She left. She took the ground dragon with her. She came to say goodbye. <laughs> You're not ready, Subaru, to do anything. I want to hear what's her rationale. It's, I think actually it speaks really well of her and his real love for him if she wanted to spare him from his fate of like doing terrible things. Okay, that's less so, but... I mean, I don't know. I, I'm always going to lean on the side of like, let me make my own choices even if they're terrible. So he does have money. Your instincts are correct. I was really spiraling. Even my loyal, useless servant betrayed me. She was supposed to do everything I told her. Wait, this one gets tired too? Where's is the white whale? He's bleeding money right now. He's hemorrhaging his wages. Someone should have told me this was dangerous. How come no one warned me? Okay. Okay. Speaking of return by death. What? What? That was uh, ominous. What are you, the Dark Lord? Maybe Subaru is the Witch of Envy. Some dark force wants him to go this way? It was a very courteous demonic force. I'm like less afraid about physical threats and more afraid for Subaru's soul. Were those corpses in the house? Was that a corpse behind the door? Oh, this is awful. These are his... This is... These are his people, right? What about the kids? Oh, that's horrible. Okay, this is worse. This is worse than the other stuff, than the Amelia stuff. Yeah, where's Ram? Where's Ram? She's probably fine. She's all right. Yeah, she's fine. We're coping. We're coping. Yeah, she, you didn't find her body, so she's all right. Oh, no, that's in her chain? Okay, but she's at least it's not attached to anything. That's good. Wait is not in Subaru's vocabulary. You should have known better, but... No. Okay, this is definitely a return by death situation. This is definitely a return by death situation. I thought this couldn't get much worse. I thought Emilio's rejection was the worst of it. In fact, was not the worst of it. I guess this is why Ram didn't want her to come. I don't know what you do in this situation. I mean, I think the only thing is return by death. This, this totally shocked me. Like, I knew there was a threat. I, I was so caught up in, like, the emotional element of things. I wasn't thinking about, you know, the actual physical threat. Probably much like Subaru, for that matter. ReZero, Season 1, Episode 8, Director's Cut, Part 2. Boy, return by, by death, huh? How about it? How about that? How about return by death? <laughs> 
<laughs> Not a fan of this device the media, but yeah, I mean. Obviously. Who like this is not fun. <laughs> this is not what who's doing this to him? Why is this happening? This is Amelia's fault somehow. I miss Elsa. The happy Roswell family. You where's what about Beatrice? It's just worse and worse. There's no way that this timeline continues. And Petra. We couldn't save her from the forest. It's not, right? If this is me, I'm just like repeating over and over in my head. This isn't permanent. This isn't permanent. This isn't permanent. Yeah. Also, as much as it sucks, I think you have to investigate to the full extreme all the way to find out who's still alive. To get an idea of what happened. To see if anyone in this place is possibly responsible. Any insight whatsoever that would help a, a future run. This can't be allowed to happen this way. When we return by death, I wonder how far back we go. Hopefully before the whole, like, courtroom trial initiation scene. This is Amelia's thing. That's the least of it. Uh, that's all. That's pretty bad. Oh yeah, one of them bowed to him on their way out from this. It would, yeah. It would appear. Okay. Damn it, we didn't find out anything. Well, it's spared on the decision, I guess. Okay. All right, we have a lot of work to do. There is a lot to get done right now. That's the kind of thing you can't shake either. Like, I can't even shake nightmares when I wake up to them. For, for like, yeah, for days. This is gonna have just major psychological impact, even though it's been undone. He's just gone. Oh, it's terrible because I don't know if it's something you can ever undo, really. Because it's not like his psyche is mapped to the reality of the situation and the timeline. It's mapped to his memories and his inner workings. I mean, I've had times when I've had a bad night out drinking that affected me for weeks without even anything that bad happening. It, like, it just seems like there's a certain point sometimes. If you spend either a, a lot of time or a very severe time in a hellish emotional state, it kind of has traction or momentum. I mean, it could definitely be countered. It definitely can be improved. But there are diminishing marginal returns to it, I think. Even after after he deals with this and finds a better timeline, there's likely always going to be some fraction, some tiny little piece of this experience residing within his psyche. And I guess that's true for everything that he experiences here. He did a lot for her, and she sees something in him. I know it doesn't look like it right now, but... <laughs> oh no, that's brutal. He's not feeling very lucky at the moment. Tough situation for Rem, doesn't actually know. I guess she believes. Really, I think only a truly unselfish person can can deal with this. Because she also has her desires here, and there's no guarantee of anything. There's just hope for the future. Though on the sick side, I don't think this is actually what Rem's thinking, but one thought that might pop in your head in this moment is, well, the longer he's incapacitated, the longer he's mine. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, wow. This version of Rem also might not be part of the... Permanent timeline. What are you? Okay. Maybe it goes differently this time. Nice. Maybe she fights harder for Subaru. She did. Okay, no. Why are they so powerful? Okay. Oh, these are the people that kill her, her village. Where are you taking him? Uh, yeah, I don't feel like she stands still here and lets it happen. Similar reason to die. Weird, it's weird that Sabaro seems to have a connection to them and they seem to have a certain reverence for him. You know, one of them bowed to him the last time. Now that they're just taking him somewhere. I mean, he is being sent here by the witch, a witch, and he does have very dark powers at his core. And I think it's pretty clear his existence is not here for good. なるほど。これはこれは確かに興味深いですね。あなたもしや傲慢でありませんですかね。See one of the deadly seven deadly sins himself. Oh, pride actually would be a great fit for Subaru though. All right, can you take it down a notch? 
私は魔女教滞在司教。Good for you. タイダー担当。スロマネコンティ。ダンス What do you want? なかなかなかなかなかなかに。今日が乗る光景です。実に実に実に。Wow, I'm getting Demon Slayer vibes. This is truly hell. <laughs> you have to just sit comatose listening to this guy ranting. The day of the ordeal. I think she's fine. She's alive, I mean. So proud of you. Or, I guess. Or not. Where can I get my hands on a copy of this gospel? <laughs> Even the, the sloth soldiers having doubts about this dude. He keeps saying that. Okay. Goodbye. Don't leave me alone with him. God, they hate his writing so much they like, have learned to melt into the ground. Their bodies defying the laws of physics to escape him. But there are definitely moments where I could use that ability. What is he getting out of this love stuff? Oh, I'll take one. Don't do that. Pretend. Oh, interesting. Oh, he's still in there. That's not, it. That's not the issue. He's not brain dead. Sloth, the kind of fan to watch an anime and call the protagonist a crybaby. Those are my gut instinct watching him. I don't think he's mad either. I think he's a little bit confused and lost and has a terrible personality. It's like a lot of motion to go nowhere, if you know what I mean. It's like when people try very deliberately to be edgy or like people who try very hard to give a facade of being quirky. I mean, one thing I do believe is genuine about him is I think he's he's actually terrible. I mean, I don't really know what Slothful means, if I'm being honest. But like one thing he's not doing that he could be doing, one thing he's avoiding doing is the difficult emotional work. Or that's at least where he was before all this started happening, which kind of almost deems it irrelevant in comparison. There's not a lot of time here. To do emotional work. Oh, it's, oh, she's here. She came from. Please kill him, Rem. Yes, thank you, Rem. <laughs> He's probably really powerful, though, unfortunately. Or maybe not. Ah, oh, it's just so cool. As far if you can do anything now, it would be a great time. Yeah, look, look at her fighting for you, with like nothing left. Oh no, no, don't smile, don't smile, and we're like this. Don't look at him. Oh, he just did that telepathically. So we're gonna puppeteer. I hope that this snaps him out of it because of how wrong it is. There he is. Nothing to lose. How did he know? Wait, did I miss a thing? How did he know his name? And why is his name Beetlejuice? Oh, he did introduce himself. Subaru, even in his comatose trauma state, is better at names than I am. I could totally be going off the rails here, but I've theorized how this whole thing is somehow connected to Amelia being a witch and searching for Subaru, needing him for something or wanting to restore something that they had. I don't know. That might have been too specific of a prediction, but it does seem likely, given what this guy's talking about with love, that the whole cult, you know, the the, the sins and the fact that he's asking Subaru if he's pride, though that could be a red herring, that the whole thing is a result of something in Involving the love between Subaru and Emilia, whether or not that's that's real love or infatuation, the kind of fake love he got called out for last episode. In a way, this is a very extreme version of what feels to me to be the same thing. You know, the delusion based on the premise of love. There's nothing loving about Beetlejuice, obviously. There's nothing lovable about Beetlejuice either. I don't know. It's just standing out to me that a lot of this story is centered around Subaru and his love and the types of love he's showing and what is real love and is he really seeing people? Is he just seeing himself? And the fact that this cult, or at least this this element of the cult, is is centered around a gospel of love. And also that Beetle goes, 
Beetle Goose, Beetlejuice, is calling him out for lack of real action, despite all the actual great things around him, which could just apply to this situation where he's not actually helping Rem. But I mean, there's another possible reading of it, which is that he's not doing enough emotionally to become a, a really great person and to be genuinely loving. In a way, the love that he's expressed so far, though there's some real love in there for sure, has been a kind of lazy love where the other person is just an extension of oneself or an object for oneself and one's own emotional gratification. There's no hard work there. You know, there's no soul searching. There's no response. Ability. There's no allowing for the other person and their identity and their their wants and needs, which may not even include you. And the result of this is Beetle Goose, Beetlejuice, kind of waking him up to trying to do something, but also riling him on. I don't know. There's a lot to keep track of. <laughs> All right, I'm a little bit more intrigued with Beetlejuice now. I want him to stay around just long enough, find out what he's about, but also not to talk. <laughs> You're, yeah, I'm with you there. <laughs> Leave us with the book so at least we can read. Don't just leave me here to stare at Rem's corpse. Okay. She was not slothful. Speaking of being lazy and slothful, people will often confess by accusation for a couple reasons. I mean, one, if you're aware of your own wrongdoing, you've sort of created a template. You have like that conceptual block and you know it really well when evaluating other people's behaviors. You sort through your available blocks or schema and you pick the one that, that matches the closest. A lot of times those sorts of things, the things you see in others will be a reflection of you and, and what you think about yourself. This is true outside of the interpersonal. This is also like in games and uh, political contests, anything between two sides. You'll point to the other doing something because you know it really well and you know it because you're also doing it or thinking about doing it or have done it. It's also used as a preemptive attack because the things that we're doing wrong, the things we know are weaknesses, the things that exist as insecurities or frailties, those are vulnerable and need to be protected. And there's one possible offensive tactic that's terrible, which is <laughs> accusing the other person of it first, you know, label the other person with it before they can label you. Everyone has this experience, like somebody getting mad at you out of nowhere and then accusing you of being overly sensitive. Having someone who is unfaithful in a relationship being extremely suspicious and jealous of you. It's why often people, the, the most trustworthy people are the most trusting and vice versa. Anyway, you're slothful. Beetlejuice is slothful. You're the softful one, and also you're terrible. He just looks like he smells bad. Subaru so used smash his own head in the rocks. It was not very effective. Is that Rem? What is moving? Is she actually alive? Oh, that's agony. I'm like reserving. My hope. I don't know if, like, this is survivable. We were talking about real love. I got so misdirected and picked out by that whole, like, sorting thing. Like maybe Subaru is getting a dose of reality as well. Something more objective as to the stakes and what matters. Like, no, none of his ego stuff matters. He woke up. Yeah, at least we have something to do. Who knows how deliberate this all is too? Like, who knows how purposeful this is to get Subar into a certain state? We don't know anything. Except the beetle juice must die. She was protecting the kids too. What the hell is that? What? You weren't supposed to be here or see that. What the hell is happening? There's so much I don't know. <laughs> There's so much the part doesn't know. What is going on? I mean, they just... Whoever did that, whatever this My Neighbor Totoro monstrosity thing is, it knows, right? It knows Subaru's deal. But Subaru's not equipped for this. At least he's awake this time. No, we have something to do. We can kill Beetlejuice. We'll get to the whatever that thing was later, I guess. I know who you really are now. Maybe their feelings are a little more, more mutual at this point. They've both done the same thing for each other, at least in Subaru's recollection. Yeah, Beetlejuice is stink. Last through timelines. And you know, also the witch stuff. Amelia who? You know what? 
The Outside of Madness. I don't love it. I don't love like revenge and rage and stuff. Given what I saw in that episode, I'll take it. It's better than Komoto Subaru and like, yeah, Beetle Goose probably needs to go. Okay, this is easy to say. I'm gonna like armchair anime this, but I think what I do in this situation is, all right, high likelihood that I die. This is reconnaissance time. I've seen the worst of it, right? I'm gonna do it as many times as this takes to get this right. And there's no other reason to be alive right now. I mean, speaking of putting myself in Subaru's shoes and thinking about the technicals of this world and comparing it to games, you know, it's another great fear I would have. This doesn't happen so much anymore in modern games, but this did happen in older games. There were some fights back in the day that actually had requirements and it was binary whether it was possible or not. And if you overwrote your save before a big event that was actually impossible, that's the end of your save file. One game that comes to mind in that category is Final Fantasy Tactics. There's a certain point it asks you to save and if you save, there are no more random battles and if you're not leveled up enough and you don't have the skills to beat a very rare and particular one-on-one -on -one battle, that's just it. Your campaign is over. Which would be even worse for Subaru because there's no way to like restart the game or quit the game and go back to actual life. You would just then be tortured forever replaying the same thing again fruitlessly. Maybe the one thing that would make that not occur for Subaru is that this is less binary than a game. It's not like you need X skill at a specific point to deal enough damage to clear the HP. It's like a very dynamic world. You probably could never exhaust the full range of possibilities of things to try. But still, it's excruciating for Subaru just so many ways based on him not knowing anything, being totally overwhelmed and outnumbered, having all these limitations, and all the while having it feel like it's real life. I think the biggest takeaway for me this episode, besides intrigue in the lore, because that was so interesting what happened at the end there with the thing emerging out of the castle. And also while I find Beetle Goose really irritating, like some of the Demon Slayer demons, the stuff he's saying is interesting and like is making my imagination go wild with what is the love stuff? What is the ordeal? What is his interest in love and these characters and the castle? What is the connection to Subaru? Also, what is it saying, if it's saying anything, about Subaru's various different states of being and actions and views on love? Then the character level, also Rem being just amazing. I, this is, I think, the episode where she shined the most and giving an actual example, at least that's what it feels like to me, of that real sort of selfless love that's not really about her beyond, you know, just like the reasonable normal extent of loving someone is like something for yourself. I'm actually kind of stoked to go on this revenge journey with Subaru. Thank you.